Welcome everyone to this uh, launch webinar on the learning modules on integrated pest management on the, the fall armyworm in Africa. My name is Alan Isaac. I'm a program director at Lando Lakes Venture 37, and I'll be um, moderating today and keeping time and moving us along between the different um, presenters. Before I proceed, um, just wanna do a quick check. Can people hear me well and can people see the uh, presentation? Yes. Great, thank you. These modules were designed for direct use by trainers and teachers of smallholder farmers in Africa to equip them to help and help to prepare them to conduct training for smallholders in the field or in the settings where they work. And they were developed by Lando Lakes Venture 37 and Villa Crop Protection of South Africa under a grant to AGRA and with the support from USAID. And the technical content um, the messaging um, and approaches based upon evidence and practical experience were developed by Villa Crop Protection, a leading crop protection firm in South Africa that has been guiding farmers since the beginning of the appearance of this pest in, in Africa. Villa has assembled a team of three pest management, crop protection, um, and GAP and IPM experts. And they're with us today, and we're going to hear from them later on in the presentation. Today is the launch of the modules and is one of the promotion activities that we're going to be undertaking in order to publicize the modules and make them widely available. They are available now on a website and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We want to make them well known to those who train and could use them and the, or those who directly who train small farmers, small farmers and those who oversee the work or work in programs, both public and private spheres who work with who work with, with small small farmers, and by the way, just so everyone's aware, we're going to be recording today's presentation and posting it later on. Today, we'll start with a few uh, brief opening remarks from um, Agra and from USAID. We're going to hear from Vanessa Adams, who's a, a VP of Strategic Partnerships and the Chief of Party of the Piata Partnership at Agra. Uh, we'll hear from Aggie Conde, a Vice President for Program Innovation and Delivery. We're gonna hear from Regina Eddy um, of USAID. Um, she is the techn technology transfer team lead in the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security. And also from Rufaro Mankadze and Lillian Gachuro, um, who have been both program officers um, at AGRA, who have been working directly with us throughout the, the duration of this project to develop this, this module. And after that, we're gonna hear from Marius Boshoff, the marketing director at Villa Crop Protection. And he's going to present on the modules themselves and go a little bit in depth into what each one covers and what their main messages are and how to use them. And then finally, we'll show you a little bit of how to find the modules and a little bit about the website platform that hosts them. And then we're gonna finish up uh, the presentation today. And Lillian uh, Gichuro is gonna facilitate some Q&A with the three experts. Uh, it's a chance for you all to engage and hear from the technical team who actually produced the modules. Um, and that technical team is Mark Edwards, Johnny Vandenberg, and Dan McGrath. Um, during the presentation, we're gonna keep everyone on mute. It's a large group. We just wanna make sure that the sound is clear for everybody. Um, but we do invite you to chat your questions as we go, um, as you think of them, because when, what we'll do is we'll come back during the Q&A and we'll re-scroll from the top and we'll capture those questions and repose them um, for the group so everyone can sort of hear it and allow the panelists a chance to, to respond. So to get started, Vanessa, please uh, please start. <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, we're so pleased to be hosting this uh, or co-hosting this um, really important uh, event today. Um, I think from my perspective, I would like to underscore and appreciate uh, the significant contributions uh, which led us here. Um, obviously, uh, PIATA, the Partnership for Inclusive Agricultural Transformation in Africa, uh, of which USAID has been one of the partners from inception, um, uh, is really a critical mechanism through which AGRA delivers in the 11 countries where we have teams. Um, I think what you'll hear today is um, really part of a long process of trying to address 
in a standardized and scaled way the very significant problems which are increasing over the years and that we find fall armyworm amongst other pests, pests and, and risks which are encroaching on smolder farmers every year. Uh, it's astonishing to see the losses which smolder farmers are experiencing related to fall armyworm. This was even statistics pre-locust invasion. And of course, for those of you who have been in this space uh, since the beginning of time, um, there was of course the maize lethal necrosis phase um, at, as well. But just um, fall armyworm estimated losses have ranged in countries from uh, uh, from about um, 280 million to 1.3 billion dollars, just in um, average year-on-year -year losses. And this is huge, as you can imagine, for smallholder farmers who really cannot sustain this kind of volatility and risk. And so, the real purpose of why we're here today is that the data and the information which scientists have at their disposal and large companies have made solutions for. Um, are not reaching smallholder farmers at the, at the level, at the specificity and the time that has, has been needed. Uh, so this investment um, with Land O'Lakes and, and Venture 37 is part of a suite of investments which our teams have been engaging in over the past three years intensively. And those investments have been both regional with East African community and um, Regina will probably speak to this uh, with um, industry associations such as CropLife uh, addressing the policy and, and regulatory barriers, but also reaching to National Agricultural Research Center such as what has been done in Uganda. And um, I had the opportunity to see some of the materials that the Ugandan um, NARS have created to also inform not just on practices, but also on pesticides and what is applicable and what is legal and what's illegal and what's safe and not safe. So um, really it, the, this year is a year, as you all know, of the Food System Summit, which is a global effort to look at the long-term impacts of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals as well as looking at uh, equitable livelihoods and integrated approaches, which would be, as mentioned by others, um, climate mitigation and adaptation um, measures, which are required to reduce the increased volatility at smaller farmer levels. So this is to reiterate the critical nature of this work, the urgency of having um, both private and public investment and engagement in reaching smaller farmers and I think Aggie will underscore the efforts that have been done around extension and Rufaro, as you all know, is a champion of extension services um, through village-based advisors. And we're hoping that this kind of tool will be increasingly digitized and received through text messages, radios, um, and just-in-time service delivery so more and more farmers can use the information. Uh, so we look forward to the increased uh, discussion and dialogue with all the partners who've joined today. Um, I want to reiterate the leadership that the FAO have been providing over many years. Global action has been an effort that uh, really mobilized attention in this critical topic and is, as well led the way um, with other investments in, 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 in developing solutions to problems um, which are really affecting millions of small farmers today. So with that, um, back to you and thank you all for joining. I think this is a really, really valuable uh, event and, and one of a series which um, all of us should be convening regularly about. Thank you, over to you. Great. Thank you, Vanessa. Just a moment here, I'll advance. Great, Aggie Conda, please. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I lost the first part of the session. My audio wasn't working, but I managed to hear most of what Vanessa spoke to. Um, so I believe that I will be giving a few comments, um, but uh, following Vanessa is I don't think I need to say what Agra is here to do. Uh, first and foremost is to thank our partners uh, Pieta Partners, Lando Lex, the research institutions, our teams, 
and all those people that have been um, intensively involved in this exercise of pulling together these learnings and these manuals. Uh, and to really reiterate that uh, as AGRA, we are committed uh, in escalating these efforts to ensure that they actually reach the actual benefactors because the risks and the losses that uh, the Fula Mewam dis um, studies have demonstrated are really uh, too large to be left uh, without particular focus. But also uh, thinking through what COVID has equally done uh, to the continent and to the efforts done in agriculture is to scale up these lessons to any other resilient efforts that we need to have uh, put in place for agriculture to work, but to, for us to ensure that we are increasing productivity and ensuring that whatever we do is sustainable and, and is scalable. So while I do not that uh, today we will be launching uh, the modules, uh, my, my really ask to the team and to Lillian was to really see the detail on how we will be cascading these messages to the farmers. And, and as we all know, the heterogeneous nature of our landscape, uh, there is no one size fits all, is that we will have to continuously learn, adapt and adjust on how we send out these messages, but also how we ensure that we are institutionalizing these learnings to ensure that uh, when any other pest attacks us, we've got a model, we've got an approach that can enable us to address these issues faster uh, rather than later. So I am keen on, on learning a lot more today. I will not be doing a lot of talking. I do know that the teams have spent quite a number of efforts uh, in different countries trying to learn what we have learned. I was delighted when I was in Uganda last month to, to hear our researchers saying that we think that in Uganda we've got some of the best expertise on handling full amiwam and that, that is really some of uh, the lessons we want to see how do we scale this to all other countries to ensure that what we have learned is being institutionalized but is being used on time to ensure that we are mitigating all these losses uh, that we are seeing uh, in terms of, uh, of these pests. So uh, that said, I'd like to thank Lillian um, and the team for drawing this through and uh, look forward to having very robust conversations as we launch uh, this program. That's it from me and over to you, uh, Chair of the meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Aggie. Uh, Regina would like to uh, say a few words. Thank you, um, Alan. Thanks, um, Agra and Land of Lakes, Venture 37. Uh, this has been a fabulous collaboration. And, and um, as our uh, speakers have already outlined, a really critical one. When fall armyworm emerged in Africa, it spread very quickly across 44 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa within the first uh, year to two years that uh, impacted hundreds of thousands of uh, smallholder farmers and um, was believed to be endemic. The huge threats that people were concerned about was impacts on food security, especially maize crops, livelihoods, as well as food safety. And um, given that it was believed uh, based on research in the Americas to be endemic over time in Sub-Saharan Africa, which we continue to believe is true, we knew was gonna require uh, capacity of the system and capacity of uh, the farm sector to manage pests and diseases. So this was our uh, primary focus as we mobilized uh, along with dozens of institutions representing every sector of uh, society, you know, academic research, um, uh, the ag research institution systems, the plant protection offices, extension and advisory services, private sector, civil society, of course, the um, development and donor community, a really fabulous mobilization. But the challenge was, how do we come up with appropriate technologies, the policies to um, ensure safe and rapid access to those technologies, and then knowledge at the farm level to actually manage the pressure of the pest. Fall armyworm is about, um, you know, the intervention is very much at the farm level. It's one of a series of pests that will emerge 
in maize crops in particular, but also sorghum and 80 other crops. So it's really about building capacity to have the right tools to disseminate information and to manage the pests at the farm level. And that's why I'm so pleased to be part of this collaboration with Agra and Venture 37 to, to contribute what is, is probably the most vital piece, not just for fall armyworm, but for in, improving crop productivity writ large because improvements in crop productivity will require that we manage pests that are um, persist in the farm field. And that's gonna take uh, good ag practice as well as integrated pest management. Over time in managing fall armyworm, that became our mantra is this is about good ag practice so that plants emerge strong, they're able to withstand the pressure of, of pests and um, integrated pest management for not just fall armyworm, but the various pests that are known in the field to be limiting productivity. And as Vanessa mentioned, we're losing 20 to 40 percent of our productivity on average from pests and diseases. So imagine the increases in, in food availability and the impact on livelihoods if we can begin to manage um, that pest pressure. What's so critical about this um, uh, set of um, learning tools that's gonna be described today is that the modules, the training modules are unique in that they are addressing this challenge of scale. So not just uh, targeting uh, the farm, smallholder farmer individually, but setting up a trainer of trainers network, uh, empowering the, the people who deliver extension messages, advisory service information, and through by impacting that pool of people, allowing a cascading effect where we are reaching the greatest number of smallholder farmers in the shortest amount of time. And this is exactly how we all need to be thinking how we are striving to think in all of our programs. It's about widespread adoption of technologies and improved practices at scale. So I'm very happy to be part of this today. We've been eagerly looking forward to this type of uh, training material. It gives practical information and messages, but does not overwhelm um, the recipient of the information, but provides information that is actionable in the farm field for smallholder farmers. It's a really critical gap that we have not been able to address. Let me just share one or two other high level bullets in terms of uh, USAID and, and globally, this um, pest management space and fall armyworm specifically. So we are um, working on a expanded version of our IPM guide. It started out as an IPM guide for Africa. We now are about to release a version that's specific to Asia, that also contains a lot of updated information about what we know is working, the range of technologies that are now we're beginning to have some evidence are effective. So we think that is um, coordinates really well with these modules because we've got a source of information in the IPM guidelines that can be continually drawn upon from teaching tools such as these modules and disseminated out to a network of actors. And that first IPM guide, by the way, was produced in partnership with over 55 institutions. It was the result of a three-day workshop where um, African and global scientists and researchers convened to really work through what would be most helpful for um, Africa's response at that point in time. So it's um, a widely vetted tool. The other thing that I want to mention um, briefly is that USAID is about to release a new innovation lab on current and emerging threats to crops. It's going to um, support also smallholder farmer improved production. It's going to focus on um, protecting household income and livelihoods and mitigating potential negative environmental and climate impacts of pest disease management. So we're really excited about that. We think it's gonna be a new opportunity for us to really partner, continue partnerships with all the people present here today. And the last thing I'll mention is we are working as um, Vanessa, Vanessa mentioned, um, FAO has can, launched a global action for fall armyworm uh, in 2019 with a mandate for strong and coordinated approach to strengthen prevention and to control um, uh, the pest through build, 
increase capacity. We're part of that. Um, the three objectives are to reduce crop loss, decrease the risk of spread and infestation, and establish a coordinated platform. And so we um, welcome everyone's partnership on that, but it's only through working effectively together that we're gonna really make a difference on these types of um, pervasive um, threats to productivity. And I'll turn it back to you, Alan. Thank you all for being here today. Great, thank you for those, uh, for that, those remarks in, the, in that context. Great, I'd like to uh, invite um, Dr. Luparo Mankate and Lillian Gachuro, who are gonna speak about um, some agri initiatives around IPM and fall armyworm. Good afternoon, everyone in Africa. Good morning in the US, good evening in Asia. Uh, as um, Alan has said, my name is Rufaro Madakaz. I'm going to be talking about what Agra does, has been doing on fall armyworm work. Can we move the slides, please? Next slide. So we've already heard from, from, from Regina, from uh, Vanessa and Eggy, the danger of fall armyworm. Um, the spread has been quite fast and the need for support to small order farmers to sustainably manage their cropping systems through integrated pest management. So this is um, what these uh, modules are about today. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So it is estimated that of, in 12 countries only, the losses have been over 20.6 million metric tons of maize, which is 6.2 billion US dollars which is food that could actually feed 100 million uh, people. So the, 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 the impact is huge. Next slide. So Agra, uh, what Agra is doing has been contributing to fight against fall armyworm, uh, mainly through overcoming barriers uh, to barriers and uh, any hindrances to adoption uh, of integrated pest management in four broad areas. Uh, which is capacity building efforts to, of various stakeholders from seed company personnel uh, to NAS to small older farmers. This is based on needs assessment. We've been working on basic um, research on fall army women control options, knowledge generation and dissemination of this knowledge to uh, the various small older farmers across 11 countries. We've also had engagements on policy registration of pesticides and biopesticides. Uh, next slide, please. So we are also a partner in the four annual research for development international consortia, which will increase co coordination, sustainability, and visibility of the findings from all these projects. Um, it's actually a voluntary membership to join uh, this organization. Uh, but what is just required is to contribute through complementary strengths, sharing information transparently and proactively. AGRA also collaborates with national four armyworm task forces, multi-institutional entities that serve as entry points. And we are also working, AGRA delivering models, working with consortia partners that are linked to both public and private sectors. In the private sector, we've worked with several companies that include uh, UPL in Ghana, Bayer in Mozambique, with other organizations. We've worked with Kabi in Kenya. Um, these are some of the people, the institutions we've been working with in the different consortia that AGRA works with to deliver. Next slide, please. So we've given six grants to different institutions. The first one was to lend or lex, uh, may basically to train seed company personnel on insect pest management, looking at basic toxicology and safety and pesticide application technology. Uh, 65 seed company executives were trained from 15 different countries. The next second grant was to uh, NARO in Uganda. This was to develop and promote sustainable fall animal management practices 
uh, evaluation of uh, effective and benign insecticides, yield loss assessments, and training and dissemination programs that uh, VPA Gikondi has already uh, mentioned. Seven insecticides were evaluated, 13 uh, recommended for folamine con control uh, based on similarity of the active ingredients. Uh, they've trained over 3,800 stakeholders, which include researchers, extension officers, agro-dealers and farmers. In 60 districts in Uganda, they've form formulated four information packages, produced and translated these in local languages so that the farmers are able to hear. And they're also on the radio, uh, impacting over 900 uh, smallholder farmers. We've also working, we're also working with CS I are in Ghana, uh, also looking at integrated approach of four annual, of four annual management, including efficacy tests. Uh, they also doing research on the pest biology, looking at natural enemies, exploring bioregional pesticides. They have so far uh, found, they've determined what three effective synthetic insecticides that are recommended for use, two bioregional. Uh, insecticides that are also recommended for use. They have an early warning system that is working uh, uh, also in, 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 in Ghana and an IPM module that has been developed in package for dissemination. Catholic Relief Service, um, we did a study on farmer learning to understand how the farmers learn and act on information on fall armyworm. And what they actually found was that uh, low wealth segments, as well as women, access fewer and second hand information through farmers and family networks. This is what actually works very well, like in the Agra VBA extension approach, where farmers are learning from other farmers that have been trained. So this will make the dissemination of the information very quickly. Next slide, please. Next slide. Then on the policy level, we are working to, sorry, we've gone too fast. On the policy level, we are working to, to domesticate and implement the harmonized pesticide registration systems across the East African community. And um, we have recently contracted CropLife um, to implement the project. This is mainly to build the capacity of the technical working groups and the national regulatory authorities to um, expedite uh, new pesticide registrations and facilitate private sector buy-in. And uh, last but not least is this project. We are working with Lendo Lakes again on developing distance learning modules focused on uh, integrated pest management, which we are going to hear a lot more about today. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So the, these are just a few pictures from the field. Um, so you see there are pictures from Uganda, from Ghana, of farmer training, of extension officer training, field days, and uh, the parasite. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Rafaro. And thanks to all our speakers who um, provided us with some really important context um, about other projects and initiatives and um, the, the, the issue itself. I'd like to turn now to um, Marius Boshoff of Villa Crop Protection, who will present um, quite in depth um, on the, the modules and their content. And uh, Marius, we're right on time, so please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, thank you all who took the time to, to join us on this. I think this has been a, quite, a, quite a, a journey to get to this point today, and so we uh, myself, the team, Johnny, um, Dan, and uh, Mark, uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I want to take you through some next slide there. I just want to take you through some initial thoughts uh, before we get into the detail um, of the modules themselves. I think it is keen for us. Um, sorry, uh, Ellen, you can go one slide ahead. Thank you. So just a, just a background to why we developed these modules um, and how we decided to do so. And, and I think you will appreciate that uh, 
agronomy and agronomists tend to want to really get into the field and interact with farmers and, and that's what we're good at uh, doesn't matter where you are in the world but uh, uh, finally as we as we went into 2020 we knew that we had to adapt the platforms and how we were going to, to present this so this is the culmination of probably more than than 12 months of, of working the process and having good discussions with agra and going forward so we decided initially that anything from six to eight modules was the way to go to develop this specifically for uh, for trainers of small the farmers and and managing the threat of all army work through good agricultural practices and integrated pest management uh, principles so these specialists uh, the three that you would uh, be interacting with a bit later during this uh, presentation will have created these modules uh, from published evidence, um, expert discussions, lots of interactions, uh, but all three of the entomologists have, have a strong practical experience in the field. Uh, and we've identified the main themes of each module. And um, as the previous speakers have alluded to, there's a, a wealth of experience and a wealth of published material out there. Uh, what we tended to do was to really focus on, on one of the, what are the key aspects within each of these seven modules that we wanted to convey to a trainer of small, smallholder farmers in, 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 uh, in Africa, but certainly also potential to expand it further. We decided to, to develop these, uh, um, these modules in essentially three, three mediums. Uh, first of all, uh, a webinar, a presentation that is recorded. Uh, there are trainer guides uh, uh, that is presented in various forms. And then uh, further additional supplementary material that's also available. And I think you will, you, you will agree that uh, between FAO, USAID, uh, CropLife, there are numerous, numerous uh, uh, information pieces that are available. And we have tried really to bring all of those uh, materials together in one platform that can be freely uh, made available. Uh, and we selected... Um, as a platform, uh, Agri Training, which is a website that was developed in collaboration with the uh, University of Stellenbosch, uh, the chair in plant health, I believe Professor Nick Kotzer might also be uh, on this uh, on this call. But we have developed this as a way to make sure that we disseminate this material freely, but with, we create a platform that is sustainable and will continue to develop as we add additional uh, free training material, as well as uh, other accredited training um, modules available from the University of Stellenbosch. Next slide for me, please, Alan. I think once we've created that pl platform, we realize that um, you know, in order to sustain this, it's, it will be important to link this uh, with various other systems already in place, uh, with, with, which we have started to do. The reality of a pest such as fall armyworm and to such extent various other pests that tends to, to um, explode throughout the continent is that one tends to, to believe that there are single, single solutions and, and we do often see uh, the, the use of pesticides being probably uh, number one. Whereas the principles of integrated crop management which falls under the uh, foundation of, of good agricultural practices it's about maintaining good crop health. Uh, we know that healthy plants and healthy crops are less susceptible to, to epidemics and outbreaks of pests. And therefore we have put a lot of effort into building a foundation for managing crop health rather than just jumping into singular uh, or, or specific tools that can be used to, to mitigate um, uh, fall armyworm outbreaks. Once you consider these different elements, uh, crop protection, crop protection encompassing biological, cultural and chemical control methods, we have found that uh, the best way to consider that is prevention. Prevention really talks to knowledge. Uh, what do we know about um, this disease? Uh, often um, we generalize, but as a reality, and I think one of the speakers alluded to it, that we need to customize the integrated pest management systems to the local conditions and climatic conditions, and obviously what tools may be available. But the prevention part is really about knowledge and building knowledge and making sure people and farmers understand how and what to look out for and what can be implemented to prevent. Observation in IPM really speaks to scouting, 
looking at um, pests, um, counting pests and making decisions around when to intervene. And then finally, looking at, first of all, cultural, biological, and finally, chemical uh, intervention methods. Next slide for me, please, Alan. So the seven modules that we have uh, developed essentially speaks to module one, and we've, we've jumped right in there and talking about responsible and effective use of agrochemicals. Module two is about the biology and identification of the pest. Module three is about monitoring and scouting. Module four, the economic and action thresholds. Module five gets into non-chemical control methods. Uh, module six into safe pesticide application, which speaks more to calibration and good practices in application uh, technologies. And then finally, we do get into some of the classes of pesticides available. Today, uh, speaking around the hazards um, and risks that are potentially involved with um, what pesticides can or may be used. Next slide for me. As we go into the different modules, module one, the content deals specifically with responsible use and we've used extensively supporting uh, documentation from CropLife International, CropLife Africa Middle East. Uh, it's really about protecting your family. It's about protecting the environment. Decisions around purchasing pesticides, uh, what are the thought process and discussion points that needs to be considered. The transport and the storage of pesticides, good practices, practices involved there and a very large focus on personal protective equipment um, as, as a means to mitigate risk of hazardous chemicals. The spraying cleaner practices, the handling of spills, and ultimately empty container management uh, in order to, to maintain responsible use. Next slide for me. So the key message that we wanted to convey in, in, in module one is really about the critical, uh, how critical it is to use agrochemicals safely. Um, and that, that is consistently a message that we are bringing over as we know that there's a lot of uh, farmers that do use uh, chemicals across the continent. Next slide, please. Module two <clears throat> gets into the biology and, and the identification of the space. We do believe that you need to know what you are dealing with. Uh, once you understand it, it's easy, it's easy to, to, to understand what, what the intervention practices could be. So we deal with the life cycle, how to identify the space, <clears throat> how to identify the damage uh, symptoms, and then introducing the concept of risk uh, to yield loss and the important of, importance of detecting the space uh, at the early stages. Uh, and, the, and the message, next slide, please. And the key message that we want to convey is that the really accurate and early detection of this pest and understanding its biology is important to successfully manage it. So it forms the foundation of, of, of the management program uh, and really empowering the farmers uh, that the trainers will be dealing with how to scout and how to improve this decision making um, for, for pest control. Next slide, please. So module three goes into the scouting and the principles of scouting. I do believe that this is one of, uh, one of the really good modules in, in how, we, how we monitor for this pest. It deals with con uh, elements such as monitoring traps, but then gets into seedling scouting and, and pop scouting and how that relates to understanding the damage and intervention methods, uh, which can be applied later. Next slide, please. Module three and the key messages is that field training and scouting is vital uh, in order to, um, to, to understand the, where the thresholds are for this disease and the, and the pivotal role that it is in assessing the risk to crop loss, uh, losses and, and help farms to decide when to take action. Right, next slide, please. Module four really gets into those economic thresholds, understanding uh, what damage causes yield loss um, and, and how much yield loss does the four army worm, uh, worm actually cause. So it's really about identifying uh, when to act uh, in, in combating this, uh, this uh, pest. Next slide, please. Key message there for the economic action thresholds in this module is that, that yield loss due to pest damage is really influenced by many factors, um, pest pressure and the age of or the stage of the plant, and, and obviously climate has a huge role that it plays in, in, in the outbreaks of this pest. So decisions about control me methods must be made uh, and determined after the assessment of risk to loss. Uh, and this is obviously a, a strong foundational element of integrated pest management. Next slide, please. 
Once we get into module five, um, we have an extensive look on published materials, also a lot of information that is uh, available out there on non-chemical cultural control of fall armyworm, looking at trap crops, push-pull strategies, intercropping, natural enemies and parasitoids that may be present in different localities, uh, local control methods. Uh, I think it's important for trainers of small-scale farmers to also find out what is currently being used uh, and locally available in terms of control methods. Uh, we have a look at mechanical insecticides and a very important element such as resistant uh, maize breeding um, and finally also the, the principles of what are GMO maize and how is it uh, practiced and what is the potential tool in the future for that uh, to be used in, in different localities. Next slide, please. So the, the key message of module five is really what practices uh, play an important role in suppressing pest numbers, uh, considering that a biodiverse and a healthy agroecosystem agro generally have lower pest pressure. And I think this is a key message that we want to convey in, in these training modules is to look at everything possible to maintain biodiversity and managing um, systems in order to, to lower the pest pressure from the beginning. Next slide, please. Module six gets into the, um, into the actual applying or application of pesticides correctly and effectively for fall armyworm. And this differs from the first module really in focusing on what does the equipment look like? Uh, what are nozzles? What are calibration uh, uh, principles? which sprayers are being used, what are the spray techniques. And then we do again recap on the use of personal protective uh, equipment in, in, in using uh, crop protection compounds. Next slide, please. And really the key message there is that pesticides, if they are chosen as a control method, the correct application of pesticide is as important as the actual product being used. Uh, and, and it needs to be a skill taught to small scale farmers when they do select this as a tool. Next, next slide, please. Key message, um, or, or, or module seven then really gets into the, into the detail of some of the pesticides available and it's by no means aimed at specific recommendation with regard to what trade names to be used or, or which companies to support. This is really about the principles of understanding uh, what does a pesticide label look like, understanding the classes of pesticides being used against this pest, it has to consider the implication of other pests that might be uh, uh, or present in a field. We look at the risk involved with some of the pesticide classes. Um, we go into some detail with regard to formulations being used, the type of, uh, whether it be liquid uh, powder, etc. We also address a very important element, which is uh, regularly not, uh, not focused on, but it's the use of adjuvants and making sure that when you do apply a pesticide that it actually reach the, reach the intended target. And then finally, a very important aspect of this, we have come to realize that a lot of the chemistry being used out there actually do uh, have resistance uh, already built up against uh, many of the pesticides. So these are the, the content elements. And uh, finally, next slide, please. The message that we want to convey there is that there's, a, there's yes, there's a wide range of insecticides available. Uh, for uh, controlling it, it has to be considered under which regulation and, and as it, is it actually regulated uh, in the country? And if so, is it allowed and legal to use? And farmers must understand how to read that pesticide label and understand insecticide resistance management. The next slide for me, please. I think finally from my slide, this is the last slide before I hand over to Alan to explain a bit more about the website and how it works. But we have initially started out and we finally decided under each one of the modules uh, to have three subdivisions. The first one is a recorded full army worm presentation as uh, to the trainers that will be training small scale farmers. And it's really aimed at, at showing an example of how this presentation could be done in the field. It's a second division uh, or second section is then that specific presentation and accompanying trainer guides that can be used by the trainers in the field. It can be downloaded in, in uh, uh, how, however format is useful to the trainer. It can be adjusted. And we in fact do uh, want the trainers to, to download and adjust and localize the presentations for the um, specific regions. 
And then finally, the last uh, is, is a supplementary training material, which consists of various, various items uh, from video clips, small video clips that allows uh, trainers to train in the field, but it also contains uh, various other material that is published by um, by other by other uh, institutions uh, across the continent and further away. I thank you very much. Uh, it's just a brief overview of these modules. Uh, I do uh, propose that uh, you go to the site. Uh, you have to register, download the material, uh, and please give us your honest feedback as we are happy to 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 adjust and and add to it uh, later as well. Over to you, Alan. Great, thank you, Marius. Good, I'd like to take a moment to talk a little bit about the website that hosts these modules and makes them available to everyone. Um, this is a screenshot of kind of the, one of the main, the, one of the module um, pages of, of the website. And just wanna point out obviously that the actual address is here at the top of the, of the screen. And we'll be including that in other materials and, and whenever we send out a follow-up to everyone who's participating on this call, we'll have that, that link as well. Um, the models will be hosted on this website, which we call AgriTraining. Uh, this is a website conceived by Villa and uh, in partnership with Stellenbosch University. And it's a platform um, that's gonna be a portal to also to other crop protection courses offered by the university, offered by um, Villa. Some of them are free, some of them are um, paid courses. These courses, these modules will always be available um, as a free resource and they only require a one-time registration. The registration helps us just understand the use and, and tracking of, of um, the amount of use of the, of the modules. Um, the, the, what we like about this particular approach is that this is a sustainable platform because it's linked to other, other courses. Um, the modules will have their own subsection here, which is under this banner, Fall Armyworm Free Learning Modules, um, and will be always accessible from the main AgriTraining um, webpage. I'd like to just switch my share screen here and give you a, a little bit of a live view of the, of the website. Bear with me a moment here while I find that screen. Okay, great. Just wanna do a check. Can you all see this, uh, this screen? Yes. Great, thank yes. you. Great, so this is the, the main agri-training uh, agri landing page. And if you go here, then you would uh, get to the landing page for the actual modules themselves. I'll just click over there rather rapidly. Um, and show you that we provide a little bit of explanation of each of the modules, all seven, a little bit of brief of information on each one. So you can navigate directly where you want to go. Um, each module, we provide a bit of a description of the different elements as um, Marius has described, the recorded presentation for trainers, the presentation and the teacher's guides for each module uh, in another section, and then the supplementary materials, um, which includes some videos, handout materials um, and supporting documentation for further information and learning. And again, of course, as I mentioned, we provide um, a registration. I'll give you a quick look at uh, one of the modules here. This is a module we spoke of before, module three on, on scouting. And it's organized in such a way that you simply um, can open up and access the different um, types of um, presentations. I'd like to just point out here under the recorded presentation, and I want to emphasize that we intentionally provided the videos in different um, file sizes because we recognize that people are working with different levels of bandwidth and internet internet access uh, ability. So there are um, higher resolution versions, there are lower resolution versions, and there's also a view online option, which is linked to YouTube. And we did this so that users would be able to actually download um, these materials on a device and take them offline to, for, for use uh, later on. And the actual training materials that a trainer might use um, in the field and with a group of smallholders, we provide them again in different formats, PDF, which are sort of closed and you can't edit, but also in PowerPoint versions, which you can edit and then adapt to your training situation. This section includes the presentations and the user's guide. And then finally, we have supplementary material 
as well. And in some cases, we provided shorter clips of different videos, which again, can be downloaded, um, taken off site, um, taken to a place where you're not connected and then projected or simply sewn on a device such as a smartphone or a tablet, for example. Great, so now we're at the end of the main part of the presentation where we've taken you, walked you through the different modules and we'd like to turn and open it up to some Q&A with uh, the different experts. And um, Lillian, if you could um, uh, unmute and join here to begin uh, facilitating. Um, Lillian and I will scroll back through the different comments and capture any questions that might've come up, but I wanna encourage everyone, now's a great time to ask questions if you'd like to, and we'll do our best to, to capture those and then re-ask them to the group and, and ask the panelists to actually respond. Um, the three experts that we'll hear from now, uh, we have Mark Edwards, Dan McGrath, and Johnny Vandenberg, um, who developed this content. We worked very closely together to uh, um, prepare the, the, the technical content, but also the look and feel and the different types of products and training products and how they might be, might be used. Lillian, if you'd like to, to start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. I think before I let our panelists respond to the questions, I'd like to maybe just reiterate a few points around the things that we have presented so far. So beyond uh, demonstrating and showcasing the efforts that we've made with this work, we would like to be able to, uh, even from the audience, get partnerships that are able to scale these materials. And we also are, are looking for uh, and inviting uh, partnerships into uh, allowing us to stay abreast, uh, even to making the, the content as current uh, as, as possible, because we understand there are a number of technologies that are being developed at present and being by validated by the different institutions. So as this information becomes available, we would like that uh, we, we are able to learn, and we believe there are many other forums that in which we can be able to update what we are learning. The second invitation is that these materials uh, are currently are being hosted uh, in the, the website we've shown, but we are looking also for opportunities to uh, host them in with other partners where the materials can also be reached uh, uh, by a, a wide range of practitioners, including posting them on the AGRA website. We're also looking at opportunities to continue to communicate at last mile through various channels. So AGRA has adopted uh, what we call the VBA model. And we also welcome partners to also participate in the pre-season training activities where we uh, also conduct and we disseminate these materials. Finally, we also understand that we are not able to invest adequately in all the areas, thematic areas of Fall Army War. Case in point is the early warning system. So we continue, uh, we would like to continue explore what are the digital and, the, and existing dig, uh, digital technologies which are available to help our farmers to stay informed and together with the local authorities be adequately prepared to handle future outbreaks. So with those uh, remarks, I'd like to uh, invite our, our consultants as have been introduced to uh, respond to the questions that are seen coming on the chat. But one of them, one of the key ones, and uh, Dan McGrath and Johnny, if you can respond to this, is the area of uh, the studies that have been done on the thresholds and how the thresholds have been determined as far as Paul and is concerned. Go ahead, Dan and, and Johnny. Hi, everybody. This is Dan McGrath. And Johnny, would you like to take a, a first stab at that? Or would you like me to start? Um, Dan, I'll just give a brief introduction and then you can explain, uh, especially the variability. But um, the thresholds as they are presented in the particular module uh, comes from the IPM guide that was developed at that meeting in Uganda, which Regina Eri referred to right at the beginning of this meeting. And it is, uh, the thresholds are based on, on, on research in South America and um, other published research and experiences we had. The group that discussed it on the particular day had in Africa at that stage, and then um, expert opinion, um, because the, actual, the economic thresholds is a, is a very difficult topic and we cannot be pres uh, prescriptive. So you, the, the thresholds that are presented in the modules 
is very flexible. And um, we should rather talk about action thresholds, not really economic thresholds in, in this case. But uh, I will give over to Dan, who could explain a little bit of why the thresholds vary so much in young plants, old plants, et cetera. Dan? Thank you, Johnny. And please jump back in if, I, uh, if you have something to share again. Um, the, first, um, the first thing to consider is that risk of crop damage is dependent on a number of factors, not just pest pressure, but also the stage of growth of the plant. Um, for example, seedlings are much more susceptible, uh, is a much more susceptible stage than mature plants. But equally important for Africa in, 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 and in general is the impact of the environment. So um, you have to take into consider all, all three of them. So, and I, I'll build a case for that in just a second. So we have those three interacting factors, the pest pressure, the plant growth stage, and the environment, or weather actually is really what I'm talking about. And then as Johnny uh, mentioned, um, where we started out with uh, in Africa is people were unfamiliar with the fall armyworm. And they, they had kind of an eradication mindset and they used what we refer to as a detection threshold. In other words, if they discovered fall armyworm in their uh, maze, they would uh, apply control measures. So that would be a detection threshold. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, the, what Johnny uh, referred to as an economic threshold, which is a, former, a, a formal uh, threshold based on uh, uh, research, which takes into account the changing cost of the control measures, the changing cost or the value of the maize, and it's very complicated. And they don't exist for Africa yet. So we were kind of trying to find a, the best middle position between a detection threshold where there's over application of pesticides, and that's what we were facing, and the economic threshold, which don't yet exist. So the action threshold kind of fits in the middle. And what basically we, we held uh, meetings with scientists that had significant amount of experience in three different climates, um, tropical, subtropical, and temperate. And the debate was, uh, okay, what, uh, what is an actionable uh, number of uh, um, fall armyworm uh, strikes, if you will, based on your practical experience. And um, the best we could do was to come up with a, a range and a starting point. So the action thresholds that are offered in these materials are a starting point for farmers to play with their system, taking into account uh, pest pressure, the timing of that, the plant growth stage, and e equally important, the environment. So someone in equatorial Africa uh, is going to have a different experience than someone in the southern part of South Africa because the climates are so different. Um, so the source of the action thresholds is based on uh, a, a consensus of a large number of scientists with uh, years of experience with fall armyworm, and they are offered as a starting point and presented as a range. So I think at this point, Johnny, um, what did I miss? No, no I, think, I think we covered it all. Uh, and I think the emphasis we had was that it, the thresholds are highly flexible and it must be seen in the context of the specific region and specific field, even where the farmer or the extension officer is, is giving the advice regarding whether control should be applied or not. So I think we've covered this. So I'd like to add one last point to kind of bring this home. If you were in a tropical area in Central Africa and 
you had a seedling crop of maize and you scouted it and you found and that did there we was, lose you? Uh, can you hear me? Testing? Okay, Dan, go ahead. Okay, I wanna give one specific example. Um, let's say you were in a, a seedling field of maize and you went out and scouted it and you found, uh, let's say 30% of the plants had small fresh window panes. Small fresh window panes means you've got an egg hatch going on and you have small larvae on the ceilings and you have an actionable uh, number. At that moment, you have two, two uh, legs of the triangle. You have an actionable number. In other words, the pest pressure is actionable and the stage is sensitive, but there's another factor and that is the environmental conditions. If, if I were in that field and there was a major rainstorm coming, I would delay my spray decision based on the environmental conditions because a heavy rainstorm might clean that field up and no pesticide application would be necessary. So in summary, you need to look at all three. You, you might have an actionable number of uh, the pest, but you also need to look at the environmental conditions, natural enemies, rainstorms, and an action threshold. So with that, a final point, Johnny, anything? Are you good? Yes, I'm good, you can continue. Good. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Johnny, uh, for that. And I believe we may want to relook at the module that speaks to this and say that it is uh, as clear and as informative uh, to the TOTs. Uh, so the, uh, the next set of questions I'd like to take is uh, one from Ivan Inisipe. He's asking why uh, we have not included biopesticides in the non-chemical control methods in module five. And at the moment we have biopesticides that have actually been registered in Kenya. What is their space in these uh, modules? Uh, you can take that question together with the level of resistance to pesticides we are now seeing against pollen worm in Africa. And the third question I'd like to take is, um, how long would it take to actually deliver the seven modules if you are sitting in a session uh, so that uh, we can also manage uh, how do we actually organize the training sessions? Thank you. We can take these uh, questions among the three consultants as you see fit. Thank you. Hi, this is Johnny speaking. I'd like to answer the last question first. Um, these modules, uh, to go through them thoroughly and have demonstrations if, if the lectures are presented close to a field where you can do a little practical or so, which we recommend, can take, uh, can take an, an, an hour or two per module. And I think this can be very tiring uh, if, you're not, if farmers are not used to this type of training. So um, watching all the presentations that we developed, one pres PowerPoint presentation with a very few, with a few short animation videos for each module, um, I think uh, if you sit right through the day and this is all you do, you can manage it all in a day. But I think the um, processing of the information and the learning will not be very good. So I would, if, if, if I had to organize a workshop to present these modules to trainers, I would at least uh, take two days to present all seven modules because there's a huge amount of information, especially when it comes to responsible use of pesticides. So, so it, it will take quite a long time to do each module. Um, regarding the biopesticides, why didn't we um, do that? Yeah. We, we did deliberately exclude it from uh, that, that module. This is a very good example of how, the, uh, how we plan to keep the information on the website very current. Biopesticides will be added at some stage. It is very difficult to keep up with all the new developments uh, uh, and to add all the time. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we decided to look at the biopesticides at a later stage um, is because the published literature on the efficacy of bio, certain biopesticides, and I want to give a few examples like um, leaf extracts uh, of specific plant species, neem comes to mind, um, and, and a few others. 
uh, there, there is no standardized protocol which we could have put on the website to say this is what you should do. And we decided to refrain from saying use a certain leaf extract because there's no standardized protocol for that. And one of the comments we had in preparation for this launch uh, from people in the field and also from AGRA, um, uh, from the organization was that we should stick to methods that was proven effective in Africa. And um, we had difficulty in saying these biopesticides are effective or those are effective because we do not have, uh, at, a few months ago when we prepared the material, we didn't have access to good material saying this is how it's done, providing recipes for extraction, etc. But this is definitely something that we'll update in future. And the pheromone for mating disruption is a, another example, something that we will get to in putting it on the website because the website is live. We will update it regularly with new information that comes to the fore. I think that covered a number of the questions. Yes, one of the questions uh, is uh, the level of resistance to pieces as we are yeah. seeing uh, at yeah. the moment. Yes, I, um, of course, there is definitely insecticide resistance developing. It's, a, it's an evolution process. We have done in our lab um, um, screening of several active ingredients for resistance against South African populations of the pest. And there were two or three insecticides against which uh, fall armyworm was resistant. Um, but I would like to caution, and of course people can differ from me, I would like to caution against us saying uh, the pest that is resistant, if we, uh, and, and, and then we do not consider the size of the larvae when application was done, the weather conditions, the calibration of the spray pump, uh, the application, uh, all those things uh, to, you know, uh, uh, all the labels that I know of, and I'm quite sure about this, indicates that the pesticides that are registered against fall army, when, wherever you find it, uh, the labels indicate that larvae from the L4 stage, from the fourth instar to the sixth instar, is much less susceptible to the pesticide. And that is why the pesticides don't work when you apply them against larger larvae. So we cannot say they are resistant. And that is where the module on biology, module two, and the module on economic thresholds, which Dan just talked about, um, gives a lot of information about early detection and how to do that and how to do scouting in order for a farmer to realize early enough that he has infestation in a field, whether it's important or uh, at a too le low level to apply. And um, in that way, we hope that we can increase the efficacy of the insecticides by a more timely application. Thank you, Johnny. Um... One of our uh, research uh, projects also uh, found that we have uh, fallen mutations that are developing resistance against uh, organophosphates and pyrethrin. And I think this is information that uh, can be published and, and shared widely with, our community, uh, with the research community. I'd like to take the next set of questions. And I think one that I've seen here is whether we have considered the combined effects of uh, fall amyoma and other pests in this training, uh, especially where we have confounding effects of fall amyoma and other pests. If you can talk to this, thank you. Well, um, we, did not, we did not address the issue of mixed pest populations at all. Uh, because it complicates the process much, uh, a lot. In uh, module three or four, we do indicate and talk about um, maize 
and sorghum stem borers, Pujola and Kailu, that may co-occur with fall armyworm in the same region or in the same field or even sometimes on the same plant. And uh, we attempted to indicate how damage symptoms may, for example, differ. But I think many farmers have got experience with stem borers. Um, so we do not address the combined uh, in, uh, combined infestations or multi-species infestations uh, because this would uh, have com complicated the matter a lot in terms of training at this stage. But but it is some, it, I know the mixed populations of stem borers and fall armyworm at the moment is getting a lot of research attention and it will be something that we could include on the website at a later stage. This is Dan. Um, one, of the, one of the dilemmas one has in putting together these sorts of materials is not overwhelming the, the introductory uh, farmers uh, with too much information. Um, because, you know, if, if you just focus in on the fall armyworm, the environment, plant growth stage, and insect interaction is quite complicated. Um, as, you know, and we run into that when we talk about action thresholds. Um, and then if you were to superimpose on that the, um, uh, the interactions and the, and the complex that you're managing, it is also, uh, it, it can be overwhelming at first. So um, let me just say that it's important. Uh, it turns out that with, and Johnny, I, I consider Johnny to be the expert on the stem bore. So please uh, jump in if you don't agree with what I'm saying, Johnny. But um, both the fall army worm and stem borers, uh, if you can get them when they're small, early in, the, in this, you know, immediately after egg hatch and before they move into the world, um, you're gonna have a better uh, uh, control uh, of them. And so some of the dimensions of the scouting program and the action thresholds actually work for both, the, they work for the complex. The other thing uh, is that many of the uh, control materials that work on fall armyworm are also effective on uh, stem bores as long as you can get the active ingredient to the insect. Uh, looking at it in a different way, there's a lot of confusion between uh, cultural control of stem bore versus cultural control of fall armyworm. And the reason uh, for that is that there's a, they have different life cycles. So the stem bore, when it matures, goes down and, and, and large part puts, makes its pupa in the stem itself, whereas the fall armyworm exits the plant and forms its pupa in the um, soil. In addition, the, 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 some of the, um, the borer species uh, will hibernate or go into what we call diapause in the crop residue whereas the fall armyworm pupating in the soil does not diapause, it hatches, it flies up into the air and is blown across the landscape. So in terms of cultural practices, uh, tillage, uh, destruction of crop residue would be good practices and we would recommend them. And they, are, they, they help with control of stem borer, but they do not help with control of fall armyworm. Nevertheless, when you're managing the complex of fall armyworm and stem borers, we can recommend uh, crop residue management and, and other uh, things that go after the stem borer pupa that are in diapause in the field. So the whole subject of multiple pest management uh, will be the subject of future modules. It's a very important question. Johnny, did I get that right? Did I miss anything? No, I think you were spot on, Dan, thank you. All right, so, so I believe we may not be able to respond to all the questions, but we're just taking a select that uh, uh, touches on the general concerns of the audience. But uh, the next set of questions we want to take, and I believe George Piri, you are, you are say, you're sending good, good comments, and I believe some of them have been touched uh, by Dan on the, the issues of detection, early detection and control, which is actually covered, I believe in module two of these modules. But I think I want, to uh, ask the next set of questions to the team and some of them, Alan, you may want to respond. One is 
language and translation of the materials to French and other languages where Folamium is a concern. And two, uh, there is a comment around there are many materials that have been developed uh, on Folamium. What makes these models unique, modules unique? And third is a comment around the impact and effectiveness of GM, genetically modified crops on Folamium. The last one I think we can take, which is technical, is whether we have proven evidence of rain uh, and, and how that is depresses the fallen moon pest populations. If please, if you can take that round of questions in the next five minutes or so. Sure, sure. And um, this is Alan, and I'll I'll just kind of respond to the first question, um, Lillian, about uh, different languages. And this is absolutely something we talked about. Um, for example, French, Portuguese, and potentially Swahili, but. Um, you know, as we develop the module, it, it, it's currently not something we're planning to do within this, the scope of this project. And, um, and, and maybe I should go first on, can you, can you okay. I, uh, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, about, about the, um, we, we, about the GM maize or BT maize in this case, um, BT maize, uh, South Africa is currently the only country on the continent where BT maize has been approved for planting by, by farmers. And we have seen suppression of fall armyworm uh, in, in the single gene, uh, one protein BT maize e events. Um, it, it, if it suppresses pest populations in the um, field and there is proteins. Uh, we have, we, we see very good control in the field. Yes, Ellen? So I just want to point out for everyone, Johnny, you have a little bit of a glitchy sound in the internet. So just be aware of that as you continue to answer yeah, the question. I'll be, I'll, I'll be short. So we see field level control with BT maize in South Africa, but we must make a very, I'm, I'm make, I want to emphasize that no BT maize event in South Africa at the moment is registered and no claims of control of full army worm are, are made. Uh, so there's no BT maize registered against the pest, but for the BT maize against stem borers, we see that it is also effective against full army worm. And I'm sure companies will register BT maize against full army worm within a year or two from now. It is effective and it will provide protection against full army worm. Thank you. And this is Dan, and I, I thought I would address the question on rainfall. Um, there are some excellent papers on mortality factors of fall armyworm coming out of the Americas. And uh, one of the more recent ones was, I believe, by Var Vara. If you would like, uh, if, if you send me an email, I've got copies of these papers. But basically, the impact of rain is specifically on the small larvae. And this is really critical uh, to recognize. Im immediately after egg hatch, the fall armyworm larvae are very susceptible to a rainstorm. Basically, the rain dislodges the little larvae and, and they perish. And I have seen situations where uh, rain, a good rainstorm right at egg hatch uh, will clean up a field as good as any pesticide I've ever used. And then if you look at the climate uh, impact, um, in a tropical environment where you have a series of heavy rainstorms after planting, you may, never, you may not see any cob damage, you may not see very much impact of fall armyworm on the crop. So at any rate, if you wanna look at the data on the impact of rain, what you wanna do is query on fall army worm mortality factors in Google, and there'll be a number of good papers that come up, and I have some I'd be happy to share with you if you'd like. But it can be quite dramatic. Um, you'll have one area, at, you'll have one area where they, they plant maize, and then as the crop develops, it's fairly warm and dry, and egg laying pressure is high, and then you're gonna see a lot of impact uh, on yield. In other areas, you plant and you have heavy rainstorms and it completely changes the effect. And this is why we need to emphasize with farmers, it's not just pest pressure. 
it's pest pressure, plant growth stage, and the environmental conditions, in particular rain. Over. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Alan, you are responding to the question yeah. of yes. language, and I think there was that other question of what makes these materials green. Sure, sure. Um, by the way, we have about eight minutes left, um, and I know there's a lot more really great questions in here. Um, on the question of language and translation, um, as I was saying, um, we do, do know that it would be um, preferable to have other these materials and available in other languages. Um, we don't currently have that um, is possible under the, this project. But um, uh, the other thing we were we were grappling with is the, the, the size of this material, once we got the modules to a point where they were really ready to go and presentable, we, 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 we do have to, to look at the challenge of translating. There's print materials, translating that, and then there's also video and recorded material, which would also have to be uh, translated. That's a sort of a different approach to the actual translation. Um, what sets these off is unique. Um, and I, I saw that comment here. And first of all, um, if you're aware and know of other great materials, I would really like to know about them, first of all, because there are lots of other great initiatives going on there. They might tend to be country specific. And we'd really like to see those because there are really great examples of materials that are applicable for smallholder farmers. It's evolving constantly. But what we were aiming here was for a set of modules that could be used um, and throughout the continent. And it's very, very diverse. And we wanted to um, very much balance um, the uh, need uh, and respect the need of trainers to be able to adapt and modify materials to their particular setting, their particular training conditions, which are very important, which might be in a small classroom or in a field or under a tree or in a more formal setting where they actually have electricity. It varies greatly. Um, we think that's unique. And the other is that we were we really aimed the materials as to the primary audience of the teacher trainer to equip them, those who have direct touch points with smallholders, um, and to prepare and help them to refine and, and have the key messages. And that's what each of our modules imparts. And we also provide a recorded presentation, which will prepare them with both the technical material and also give them some pointers and hints about what to emphasize and why to emphasize those messages. So we think that that's a little bit of a unique feature to hear and to do it uh, with materials that are aimed at the entire continent and recognizing the diversity of the of the the growing conditions. Thank you. And uh, looking also at the time, I'd like just to take uh, one comment and I think also one question. I'm just checking through whether there is any other substantial or uh, key question. But I think even as I do that, uh, I think the question that has come through is what skills or knowledge is required? Because this material are designed for TOTs. What would they need as requisite skills and knowledge to be able to deliver on these modules? Because the one of the the one of the, the uh, attendees is saying, I, I have uh, skills on this and this, and I have been trained on this. So what do I need to be able to deliver on, on these modules? The, sec the second one is actually a comment to the panelists and the fact that uh, an awareness around the follow uh, monitoring and scouting tool. Yes, we are aware of this tool. Uh, I think for us is we need to is to get to the grassroots and for even our uh, communities to be able to use it and to be able. So there is a need of uh, some capacity building and some awareness creation around the monitoring and scouting tools that we have. So if you can respond to that question of uh, um, the trainers, what do the trainers need to have as we look for one more last question. Thank you. Hi, this is, this is Mark, if I can answer that question. I don't think trainers need anything specifically. I mean, the information is on the website. We've tried to create the, the information in a way where we prompt the trainer to enter into discussions with the people he's training, whether that's a small older farmer or a training of trainers event and uh, a lot of the, the materials have like discussion points and, and things you can try to do with farmers to make the learning experience more interactive and a lot of this comes from Dan too who's, who's, who's very good at that and is very adamant about having discussions with people instead of just telling people what to do and in this past week Johnny and myself uh, uh, went to one of these training sessions and, and, and that was very clear. It came out very clearly in the training session that 
people were quite, um, I wouldn't say shocked, but surprised to hear that this is the way one should do it. Because I think a lot of people will put a presentation up on a screen and then run through the presentation. And I think that sometimes one loses one's audience in that way. We, we need to discuss things with people. And um, I've also noticed a lot of the questions that are coming up are very, uh, I want to call them almost very scientific in terms of data and results and, uh, and evidence and things like that. We, we don't want to turn trainers into scientists. We don't want to turn farmers into scientists. We want to equip them with tools for them to make their own decisions. So, and I think that's very important. And having said that, if anybody who's on the, the webinar struggles to access information about fall armyworm, whether it's publications or reports or something, they're welcome to drop me an email. I have most of these things available and I can send them these things for them to, to look at themselves as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, just the final uh, last question is to Aram particularly is there, will there be an evaluation survey conducted on the impact of the modules in the future? And two, are the modules available offline? And three, uh, would the modules be editable to the different settings? If you can take those, thank you. Yes, I can answer that again. Yes, uh, you can download all of these materials onto your own laptop or, or tablet or whatever you use. And, and you can adapt them in any way you like. During our, uh, our session earlier this week, it was very interesting that um, some of the people that we asked um, uh, about these things, and we asked them to actually present some of the materials to the trainers we had there. And some of these people were already inserting their own photographs from their areas as context within the training materials. So you can adapt the training materials basically in any way you like. And they're all on the website, they can all be downloaded. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, to our consultants in responding to the questions, I'll hand this over back to Alan for any concluding remarks and anything I could have left out. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone, for participating and all the great questions in the chat. I, I, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but we have this transcript and we're very interested in the comments because it gives us a kind of feedback that we, we do keep in mind. Um, so we'll conclude for today. Um, after we close the screen, you're going to see the agri-training site pop up on your screens, hopefully. We'll also be following up with some blast emails um, and some social media information um, so that you can be reminded of where to find these, uh, the, these materials. And we are very interested in your feedback. There is a comment feature on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and for those of you who know AgriLinks, we're also going to be linking these materials and trainings through AgriLinks, which will make them even more um, widely available. So with that, thank you everybody and we can wrap up.